Side to um, start sharing your slides, and I will uh, briefly introduce you while you're uh, setting up your slides. And then he was a postdoctoral fellow in Johns Hopkins in uh, uh, Reza Shadmer's lab. And this is actually the time that, that we overlapped. Uh, I was a master's student at the time, and he was a postdoc. And uh, we, uh, we've done some, uh, 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 in my mind, some of the great works together. Uh, one of our best papers, or my best pa pa papers, are with him and under his supervision. Uh, later, he joined the, the Harvard University. He is now heading a, a neuromotor control lab uh, there. And um, uh, he has received many honors and rewards, of course. Um, uh, and, and uh, like, uh, including a Sloan Research Fellow and McKnight Scholar. And uh, he is mainly working in motor control, and computational motor control, control, learning to learn, and uh, um, a highly respected and cited researcher in this area. So um, it's a real pleasure to be here um, um, today, um, despite the sort of technical snafus that ran into the beginning here. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's a real pleasure, in particular, to get a chance to, to connect to, um, to, to, um, to Ali, um, who um, I, I've known for um, a very long time, ever since he sort of um, first came to the U.S. as a, as a master's student um, to Reza Shadmir's lab at, at Johns Hopkins, where I was. And um, I remember sort of, you know, when we spent maybe a couple of years together there, um, that you know, just, just how sort of, you know, how bright and engaging um, he was and, and, and how, you know, sort of each sort of tension for sort of questioning sort of, you know, um, you know, almost everything um, that we did and, and, and talked about and I thought that was, um, you know, um, um, that was absolutely sort of fantastic. Um, and, and so um, I, today, I, I, I talked to you about some sort of unpublished work um, um, from my lab that I'm really sort of um, excited about which is um, lo looking at, at, at really trying to sort of um, really understand um, um, how um, really error signals um, are, are processed for, for motor learning. And so, um, so, so, you know, we've known for, for a very, very long time that, um, that motor errors are, are really, you know, a key teaching signal um, for, for, for motor learning um, abilities, right? I mean, you can also have, you know, uh, of, of you know, information about, about success or failure um, as a teaching signal for, for sort of reinforcement learning. But, um, but error signals are, are, are critically important and, and they contain you know, much more in information sort of, um, than, 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 than reinforcement, um, mainly because reinforcement is, is intrinsically a, a scaler, right? And, and, and it's, just, it's a sim single axis of sort of you know, good or bad reinforcement or success or, or failure, um, but, but, but Error is, is a vector, and um, and and being directed, um, you know, tells you, um, <clears throat> um, tells you, gives you more information, and, and we think that um, that that sort of you know, that motor that that, um, that motor learning sort of uh, mechanisms, um, when when error inf and reliable error information is available, um, can can sort of make better use of this and and, and learn um, more uh, uh, more strongly. And, and so I'm going to talk to you today is, is with some sort of new work that, that we've done, which is um, showing that, that these air signals are, are sort of, you know, refined um, to an extent that, um, that goes, you know, beyond um, what, um, what, what people previously, you know, thought happened and possibly, probably what a lot of people previously thought might, might be possible. Okay, and I'll show some evidence for this. Okay. Right. Um, so there, there are a couple parts to the talk. Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting time. I probably will just sort of focus on, on, on part one, which, which is the main one here, um, which is about sort of you know, denoising the, the teaching signal um, for, for human motor learning. Um, next. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. So I was going to show you um, a, a, a funny video here. This is the only video in my presentation, so the fact that it didn't, didn't convert properly is, is, is not a big deal. Um, and also to describe the, the, the video, and I'm probably going to fail spectacularly and making it making it funny. Um, but um, the, the funny video is that there's a um, <clears throat> there's a there's a late night um, talk show host, sort of as a comedy program that comes on um, late at night um, in the U.S. Um, hosted by um, a guy named um, Jimmy Fallon. And one of the little sort of 
um, sort of uh, gigs, I guess, that, that Jimmy, Jimmy likes to sort of um, do with, with some of his guests um, is, is, is to play um, this, this, this game called um, Pong, where, where he sets up um, a sort of like an, a triangular like array of, of cups um, and um, on a table, um, one, on, one on each side, and, and he and, and, his, and his opponent, his opponent being a guest on the show, um, um, a ping pong ball um, into in, into one of the cups in, in, in the array, right? So that it looks like there's like, you know, it's a, it's a four sort of um, in a triangle side of fours. There's ten cups there, um, and and so what? This is a little choppy, but what the what? Um, so the, the, the guest is, is Helen Hunt, who's is a sort of famous actress in the U.S. And of course, um, she she doesn't play this game all the time, and and she keeps missing um, with with this, and in particular. Um, if you look at her throws, like they, they seem like they come up short. And if you reason about that just, just a little bit, um, it seems sort of reasonable. So she's a little embarrassed that she misses so badly. Um, and, and Jimmy, who's the, who's, who's the host, sort of he makes this on, on his first shot and he walks away la laughing, right? Um, and this is all sort of in good-natured fun. Um, but if you think about this for a little while, like, you know, it makes sense that she, that she might miss um, short because um, a ping pong ball is, is really light and a little bit sort of counterintuitively because it's so light, you actually have to throw it harder than, than, than one think you might because um, because it's, it's so light doesn't have very much momentum in the air and it gets slowed down by um, by wind resistance you know more than more than most balls that we throw right and, and so um, n next slide can, can we go to the next slide yeah and so um, we, we can think about sort of analyzing like you know this this error that um, um, that, that she made right. And so um, here's a little sort of schematic with, with, with um, you know, um, Helen Hunt's hand or anybody's hand um, throwing a, a little white ping pong ball um, towards a cup. And so there's an array of cups there, so the game's a little bit easier than this. But you, just, you can imagine she's aiming for, for one of the cups, maybe in the middle or so, okay? And then next. Um, and, and so she's aiming for this cup. Um, but um, if... Um, <clears throat> um, um, but, but when, when she makes the throw, right? Even if her, um, um, uh, if, even if her execution was exactly as she intended it to be, so she, her hand motion was ex exact, precisely what she intended, there could be what I would call an externally generated error, right? Due to um, you know the fact that she's sort of unfamiliar with with the weight of the ball and and how that weight of the ball would would interact in terms of its dynamics with the um, with the air and, and, the, and the trajectory that that it, that it would lead to right um, but of course there can also be next slide um, an, an externally generated air right um, that goes on top of this internally generated air um, that is um, um, that, that comes from from the, the fact that um, that when, when, when she moves her hand, um, it might not move like just as quite as fast as she wants it to, right? Or, or her hand might move a little bit to the right of where she intended, or a little to the left, or maybe maybe moves a little bit too fast, right? And so what I'm trying to illustrate here over on, on the left side of the screen, all right, so if you look over on, on the left side of the slide, there, there's one dashed line that represents the, the motor plan of how the, the, the plan for the ball to sort of approach the cup and then go right into the middle of it, right? And then there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's another um, dashed line that would represent um, the, the trajectory due to some externally generated error, right, that was caused by um, the fact that, that, um, that, that the player is, 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 you know, has, has a model um, of how the ball is going to fly through the air that, 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 that's wrong, right? And it, and it could be, you know, because you just don't, you don't appreciate, um, you know, the, how the weight of the ball or because they don't appreciate for that weight of the ball, um, you know, just how much the wind resistance is going to impact the motion of the ball in the air, even though we've been throwing, you know, most of us have been throwing balls all our lives to some extent, right? Um, and then the, um, the, the gap between the, the middle dashed line and, and the solid line, right, could represent some internally generated air that's due to um, the fact that, um, you know, even when, when, when you try to, to, to do something physically, um, your body doesn't do precisely what you want, right? So um, I'm a big basketball fan, and, um, and, 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 um, and you know, in the, in, in the NBA, of course, there are, you know, there, there are, um, you know, there, there, there are players who, are, you know, are, you know, are incredibly good at basketball. They're, they're just, you know, amongst the best basketball players in the world. Um, and, 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 and they're, you know, highly sort of incentiv incentivized financially and otherwise, and they're primed to, to do the play as well as possible. And in general, 
these 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 men like you know they they, they practice and, and play like you know really intensively right um it, it takes a lot of work to get this good and 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 if, and they're also really talented but but the best players right can't sort of make even the sort of like the simplest shots every single time right and so of course when you're when you're, when you're playing a, a you know an active game of basketball there are lots of reasons for this because you have opponents and they're playing defense on you and 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 this you know makes it that you have to sort of change what you're doing on, on the fly and, and make things difficult, especially if the defender is is, is really accomplished. Um, but even a, a simple shot like a like a free throw, right, where there, there there is no defender and you're doing the same thing over and over and over again, like no one can do it perfectly all the time, right? So even even Stefan um, Curry, who's in the best a free throw shooter in, in the NBA right now the last several years. Like he, it's remarkable he can make 94% of his free throws or, or something like this. Um, but, um, but, 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 you know, he still misses, you know, six to 8% of his free throws. Right. And, and so this is sort of the internally generated error that I talk about. And so, and, and of course, in, in most of us internally generated errors for, for making free throws, we like much larger um, than, than what um, Steph, um, Steph Curry's internally generated errors are. But even in, in, in the best, individuals like this, this, this is substantial okay and so um, <clears throat> you, if you want to sort of think um, through um, what's sort of going on here in a, in a sort of an engineering kind of um, sort of flow diagram um, what you can see there's there's, there's a um, there's, there's a box and arrow diagram here that starts with um, it, it says that well on, on top there's some sort of overall motor air that this is IGE internally generated air plus externally generated air right um, and um, if you um, if you, you could take this internally generated this overall motor air and then um, convert it to um, just um, externally generated air showing the blocks below it by trying to sort of subtract out a, um, a prediction of what the internally generated air is right and there's lots of reason um, to to believe that 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 the that the brain um, you know can um, um, can make um, useful pr um, pr predictions um, Okay, of of our motions, right? And so the the idea behind this is is that there there are neural mechanisms that produce um, efferent copy of, of our actions. So when we um, so um, when when we make motor actions, of course, the, the the main sort of purpose of this of this action is to generate some motor output that flows down to our muscles and then and then creates movement or, or force, right? Um, or some combination thereof. Um, but but we know that when um, this um, motor output not only goes um, down the spinal cord um, and, and, and into our muscles, but also um, gets gets sort of um, broadcast throughout the brain, right? And um, and this this signal is, is called motor efferent, so it's a signal coming from the um, um, from the central nervous system. Um, this is this is it's called efferent copy, where it is a copy of this um, that gets broadcast throughout the brain, and 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 and. It, and it's been shown in, 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 in other sort of ex experimental settings um, that you can, um, that we have um, signals um, of, for motor efferents that are sort of you know, broad throughout the brain and, and that these signals are, 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 are used in, 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 especially in sensory processing, okay? And so here we're suggesting that this efferents copy um, is, is used in motor processing. People have, have thought this before, but in particular to, um, to um, that you can subtract this um, this, 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 this prediction of the motion based on efferent copy from the ideal motion to get a prediction of, of your error. And this prediction of the error, of course, will just be prediction of this, so the, the internal contributions to error, the difference between, based on the difference between what your motor command actually was and what you intended it to be, okay? And then you could use this to subtract, um, out, uh, um, to subtract it out of the overall motor error Right to to just get an estimate of what the externally generated um, component is, right? And the reason this would be a good thing is because um, if you had um, an externally generated error due to the fact that you're unfamiliar with how the the sort of the system or the world or your body would would, would in some sense would would respond um, to your actions, right? Then you would want to um, to use that information to update your planned actions for for, for next time, right? Um, and, and, and upstate sort of the motor execution next time. But if there was just, if there was an internally generated error um, that was due to some sort of, you know, some, some noise, right, that, that, you, that you can't control. So if you could control the noise that gen led to gen internally generated motor errors, then you, just, you would, you, would it, it, you know, the first, um, first bluff, the thing that you would 
thing to do would be to sort of you know control it so it was you know, it was nearly zero, right? And then you could you could have you know sort of in some sense mistake free um, actions or actions or at least that that, that that didn't um, you know suffer from this internally generated noise, right? And they were really precise, um, but um, but 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 you can't. And 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 to our best knowledge, um, these internally generated errors are, are really l largely random from sort of one moment to the next, and certainly from sort of one movement to the next, which is which is you know, several movements are often seven several seconds apart. Um, and and so um, if, if there's if there's something that's just totally random like this, right, and then and that the, then the essence of randomness is that it cannot be predicted. And um, and then if you if if we um, use this as part, if this was part of the teaching signal for motor learning, this would, this would basically add some sort of unpredictable noise um, to, our, to our teaching signal and, and, and would corrupt it, right? And, um, and you know, the essence of, of something being unpredictable is the past doesn't tell you what happens in the future. And so if you adapted to some motor noise due to internally generated error um, from um, past experience and has no um, predictive value with what's going to happen in the future, then it, it's not. It's only going to hurt you and 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 not help you. Okay. Next slide. Okay. So so here's just an illustration um, of this. And so um, in in purple, I, this the purple circle is is the start point of a simple um, simple reaching movement from um, from the from the start point um, to the end. And so next. <clears throat> Um, and, and what I've shown here are, are two sort of um, trajectories or, or two sort of hand motions, okay? And so um, in, in, in one hand motion, um, the, the hand moves almost, almost exactly to, um, um, to the target, and, um, and, and in another, um, it might move um, off to the side, okay? And so next slide, okay? Um, and, and so for this um, um, motion that's, that, that's off, off to the side, right? Um, you, you could think of, of, of this as, as being that in, in, in the brown case, um, there was very little internally generated air, um, and in the yellow case, there was maybe a larger um, internally generated air that was, say, you know, three, three degrees to the left in terms, of, in terms of the heading or something like this, okay? Um, and so um, and on, on, on the next panel, um, what we see is a <clears throat> um, small sort of sample um, of, of data um, showing sort of internally generated errors in the in the in the thin brown lines, right? So if if you take just a sample sort of at, at random of 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 you know, six to eight movements is what's shown here, um, what you see is that the directions of movements from the start position to the target um, they vary. Um, you know, in general they're pretty close, but they vary by with with a standard deviation of about two degrees in terms of two and a half degrees in terms of the in terms of the initial. Um, <clears throat> Initial movement angle or initial heading of, of the movement. Okay, and what we're going to and um, and if we want to um, sort of dissect the difference between internally and externally generated errors um, experimentally, then what we could do is we could take advantage of the fact that we sort of know the, you know the, roughly the statistics of these internally generated errors, meaning that they, that they're sort of white noise um, that they're you know which which is random from one trial to the next and and they have a standard deviation of about about two and a half degrees and we could give um, perturbations um, that um, have roughly the same statistics right that are white noise um, and have um, a variability of two and a half degrees this is a little bit wider here just because the the, the um, perturbations are on the end um, the plus or minus four degree perturbation shown is, is yellow or, or or brown or dark brown here um, or, or less frequent than, than the ones in the middle Okay, um, and so what we can do is um, is is, um, is is see whether the motor system can do this dissection between internally and externally generated air by experimentally controlling, right, the sort of externally generated air and um, and measuring the internally generated air that has the same statistics and look and see um, that, that you know to what extent motor adaptation um, responds to each one of these. Okay, next panel. Okay, so on the bottom here is just a, um, it's, it's just a, a time series um, of of the sort of the amount of sort of directional air, right, as a function of um, as a function of, of of movement number or trial number, right, um, for um, like in in sort of a typical experiment that, that we ran um, for this study, right, and so um, what you see is that there is um, the the, um, <clears throat> the time sequence of of light brown 
um, um, errors, which are internally generated errors, um, it has the same, roughly the same statistics as, as, as that for the externally generated errors shown, shown in red, right? So, of course, these, these, are, these are random, independent from one trial to another, right? So not statistically correlated, but they have, you know, they have the same mean, which is about zero, and, 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 the, same, and the same variance, and, and, and the, the same sort of higher order statistics, which is something that, that's close to sort of a zero lag one autocorrelation. Okay, all right, next. Um, and so this is just showing an example of how we, we how, how these things um, can be dissociated, right? So on the left is, is a movement where um, the hand made an error of minus three degrees, which is which is pretty common, shown in, as, as the blue arrow. Um, but there was a um, there was a visual perturbation, okay, of plus two degrees that rotated um, the, the the visual feedback of the motion, the cursor motion shown in green, by plus two degrees, and and then that the net effect. Um, was this total error that you can see in the bottom is minus one degrees, right? If you add the inter exter internally generated error, which is minus three, the external generated error, it's plus two, you get a total error of minus one. And on, on the right, um, what we see is, is just this, it's another example of the same, similar kind of thing happening here. We have a internally generated error plus three degrees, so three degrees um, clockwise, um, and then externally generated error or visual rotation of the cursor of, of minus four degrees, um, so the total error of, of the cursor with respect to the target is, is minus one because plus three um, uh, added to minus four gives, 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 you, gives, you, gives you minus one, all right? And so now we can, we can take these two sort of um, examples and, and look for similar um, cases that, that, that occur sort of um, um, during, during our experiment and look at the adaptive responses. And what we see here is um, the case where and so in both of these cases, the total error was about minus one degrees, right? So you can see that there's two sort of um, circle, sorry, there's two squares plotted on this plot where the total error is um, approximately minus one degrees, right? Um, um, but in, in one case, this total error was generated by an external, the top, the, for the top um, square, this total error was of, of one, negative one degrees was generated by an externally generated error that's yellow, which is minus four degrees, and an internally generated error, which is sort of dark blue, which is like plus um, three degrees, right? Um, and in, in for the bottom square, what you see is that this total error of, of minus one degrees was um, generated by an internally generated error of minus three degrees, as opposed to plus three degrees, and an externally generated error of plus four degrees, right, to give, giving a total of, um, <clears throat> of roughly minus one. Right, and what we see on the y-axis is the adaptive responses in these two cases were um, systematically different. Right, so it's hard to see here, but you can see error bars on, on this plot. Okay, um, and then next. Okay, so I was just showing you two data points from the experiment. In the experiment, what we did was was have um, uh, was have was have visual VMR, visual motor rotations or visual perturbations that range from minus four degrees. Um, to plus four degrees. I'm looking at the legend on, on the right side, okay? Um, and, um, and then there were internally generated errors that we didn't control. It just came from, from the person's own sort of sloppiness in, in, in their own movements that went from minus three, to, in, in, the, in the left legend, going from minus three degrees in, in light um, blue to plus three degrees in, in, in dark blue, right? And then for, we, we bin the data into sort of all combinations of, um, we made a sort of five by five grid to all combinations of internally generated air and externally generated air. And because these are independent of each other, there were, there were sort of, you know, roughly the same um, size, number of data points in, in, each, in, each, um, um, in each of these sort of 25 grid points. And then plotted the adaptive response versus the total air. And what we see here, right, is, is that there's, there is, you know, somewhat of a systematic relationship here, but, the, but overall, total air doesn't do a great job at explaining the size of the adaptive response, right? So um, it does a significant um, job at it, but, but we, we can explain like 52% of, of, of the variances. R squared is just 0.52 in the middle of the plot here, right, for the adaptive response, right? Um, but if we look at this plot a little bit more closely, what you can see is the adaptive response, um, even though it varies a lot with the total, um, you can have a high adaptive response, adaptive response of near one degree for several different values of, of total error. We can see is all the cases that have high adaptive response um, have symbols that that the for the outside is 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 yellow, meaning the externally generated error is is, is minus four degrees, and then um, almost all the cases where the adaptive response um, is is minus one degree, so in the, near the bottom of the plot have 
um, external generated errors that are plus four degrees shown in sort of in, 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 in dark brown. And um, most of the cases where the adaptive response is, um, is, is near zero, so near the middle of the plot vertically, what you see is that um, the adaptive responses are, um, the external generated errors are about zero degrees. And this is sort of independent largely of, of what the um, internally generated error is, okay? So next plot. So if we um, then um, <clears throat> plot the adaptive response as a function specifically of the internally generated um, part of the error, right? note that the x-axis has changed here, then what we see is that there really is like very clearly no systematic, very no systematic relationship between the size of the adaptive response plotted on Y versus the internally generated error, IGE, shown, sh shown in X here, right? And, and the, the, the R squared here is, is like 1%, right? Um, and then the slope is, is 0 0.02 and not statistically significantly different from zero. But if we alternatively, next slide, um, plot the adaptive response as a function of the externally generated component of the error, so the size of the perturbation, right? Then we see is a really, really strong, um, clear, um, relationship, right, where we can um, account for 92% of the variance in the adaptive response by the amount of, 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 of the perturbation or the, the externally generated error, right? And this is, in a way, sort of, you know, um, this, is, this is fantastic, right, suggests that the adaptive responses are related to the perturbation that was levied rather than the error, right? But this, this implies, right, what we were sort of speculating um, at, uh, on, the, on a couple of slides ago, that the motor system um, or the sensory motor system that is sort of doing this, the generating this adaptive response is somehow separating out this externally generated part of the air from the internally generated part of the air in terms of making your adaptive response, right? And so the idea is that um, whereas people pre sort of previously thought that adaptive responses um, you know, came from sort of you know, observed errors or, or close cousins of them, um, here you see that, that what you can do is you can refine these errors, right, by, um, by taking into account what, whatever your internally generated um, um, contributions to them are um, so that we can um, really just sort of zero in on, on, on the externally generated components, right? Even when these internally generated errors are, are, are only like two or three degrees, like really, really small, right? We can effectively um, subtract them away, right? And the fact that you can do this well um, in terms of the, the fidelity of these adaptive responses with respect to external generated errors suggests that that you can predict away these internally generated errors like really accurately, right? Because if you if you predict them away inaccurately, then the sort of the errors in your prediction would sort of outweigh the benefit of, of doing the subtraction, which is sort of a classic kind of you know um, mean variance kind of trade off in statistics. Okay, next. Um, so this is this left plot is just is just summarizing sort of um, a, a slightly different analysis, but so um, for, for um, the data I've shown uh, on the left here, what we're doing is is, um, is is binning this um, binning the data um, into this 25 um, grid points of, of IGE versus EGE for each individual, and, and showing the average across individuals for for each of these each of these squares. That's why you can see error bars on them, right? Um, here uh, we did is just um, for each individual um, um, calculated um, did this analysis and, and calculated the slope um, of the relationship between which is the sensitivity of the relationship between adaptive response and either externally generated air shown as the red bar or internally generated air and took the air bars across those estimates of, of, of slopes. And we see is that for external generated air, there's a, there's a, there's a slope or a sensitivity um, of approximately like 0.2, which means that about 20% um, of, of the air that of, of the externally generated air um, that, is, that is estimated um, is turned into adaptive response. So we, we, we we, we show an adaptive response that compensates about 20% for an error experience on, on, on every trial, okay? Um, but for internally generated error, this is essentially zero, okay? And then gray is just a control for um, when, 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 when there's no visual feedback, and that's also not necessarily different from zero. Okay, next. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, so um, <clears throat> um, for these kinds of perturbations um, where, where there's, a, there's a rotation of the screen, there's been a lot of a fairly recent work um, that shows that, um, that you, can, you can compensate for these perturbations in, in, in one of two ways, either from sort of implicit learning where um, you're sort of not aware of, of, of the compensations and, and they're automatic versus sort of explicitly planned 
um, compensations. And the way we did this project experiment, we couldn't actually tell what fraction of the learning was, was implicit versus explicit. So we decided to just do a version um, where, we, um, <clears throat> where we could measure implicit and explicit learning. Okay, and, and, and the idea here is that before each trial, we ask subjects to aim like where they thought they should move in order for their cursor to get to the target. So we, we told them loosely that, um, that on different movements, there, there was going to be a visual distortion of how the cursor moved with respect to your hand. Even though you couldn't see your hand in the task, there's going to be this distortion. Um, and so by, they, could, you know, maybe, they could maybe help themselves by placing an aiming marker um, um, at some place to, 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 um, to compensate for what they thought the distortion might be. All right, and then we could use that, um, that placement to figure out the explicit component of the, um, of, of the adaptation. Look at the difference between the hand motion and the aiming marker. Look at the implicit component of the adaptation. Next. Next slide. Thanks. Okay, and so um, if you do this, what you see is, is in this task where the errors are, um, are, are really small and these perturbations are really small and random from, from one trial to, um, uh, from one movement to the next, is that, um, um, is that the adaptive response um, sensitivity for overall learning um, looks, you know, pretty much like, like it did before, right, where the responses are um, for, for externally generated errors are large and for internally generated errors are, are, are really small, shown in blue. Next panel. Um, but if you, if you break this down, which you, which you can do in this experiment, into components for um, explicit strategy learning and implicit learning, um, what we see is that in this particular experiment, there's almost no explicit strategy. So there's different sort of versions of ways you can sort of do this kind of motor learning. And you can sometimes see explicit strategies, usually when there's a, when there's a consistent um, perturbation that's consistent from trial to trial, even though the sort of the rules for this haven't been worked out. And so in this case where, we, where these perturbations are, are, are sort of white noise and small, what we see is there's very little explicit strategy. And so this dichotomy between sort of um, external generator and internal generated error, we were seeing this for the implicit part of, of, of the motor learning, right? And because there was no explicit learning, we can't tell this experiment whether explicit learning um, sort of you know, has the same dichotomy um, or not, right? But, but it, it tells us that um, implicit learning shows this um, dichotomy where um, this implicit learning is a res response to externally generated errors shown in, in red versus internally and, um, and not to internally generators and errors shown in, in blue. Ne next slide. Okay, so <clears throat> um, there's, there's a, 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 a related idea that's been um, put forward that's really sort of the prevailing theory for, for error-driven motor learning that's called sensory prediction error. Um, learning, right? And this has been propagated and in, in, in sort of espoused in, 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 in lots of papers. And there's a, a partial list um, um, here, okay? Um, and, and the idea, um, um, next. Okay, um, and, and the idea is that sensory prediction error drives implicit adaptation and motor performance error drives, drives strategy, right? But I would submit that the evidence um, for this is, is, is somewhat thin, okay? And I'm gonna go through this right now really, really quickly. And so um, S, um, sensory prediction error has been defined as the difference between the observed action and, and the prediction action. So it's, 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 the, it's the prediction error, the difference between what the prediction was and, and what was actually observed. And motor performance error is the difference between the observed action and the goals, so the error in performance, what, 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 you, what, what, what you did and what you, what you intended to do, okay? Um, next. Right. Um, in, in contrast, right, um, this um, externally generated error that, that we've been sort of um, talking about here, which seems to sort of control motor adaptation in, in, these, in, in this last couple of experiments, is the difference between um, the predicted action, okay, um, and, and, um, and, and, and the goal, right? And so um, the idea is that you would clean, you, 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 you would um, take the, the observed action, right, and then subtract out, right, some um, so the predicted sort of, you know, error in it, right, um, and, and, and then and, and to get what the predicted action um, outcome would, would be, like, you know, once you, once you subtracted out what you thought was caused by an internally generated error, and then subtract the goal from that. So it's different from both sensory prediction error and, 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 and motor performance error. Next. 
Okay, um, and so the evidence for for sensory prediction error comes from you know primarily from sort of one study and some follow up studies that did almost the same thing, and so here the the idea was that um, <clears throat> um, was was that in this paper by Mazzoni and Krakauer two thousand six um, they showed that predicted action sort of you know it included strategy and in particular what they did here was. They had people do a, a, a vision motor um, rotation experiment, um, but here the vision motor rotation error, error was, was really large, right? So they had, I think, like a 30 or 45 degree rotation, and it was consistent, <coughs> occurring consistently from, from, from one movement to the next. And, and what they did was they, um, was they, they told um, individuals that, that this was going to happen, and, 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 and next slide. Okay, and what they did was they gave them an aiming target, and they said, "Well, you know, if you aim, um, say, thirty degrees um, to the left of of the goal, then your then then the cursor that you're going to see is going to move towards the goal, right?" And so people obeyed the instructions faithfully, and um, and and what resulted was that you know um, was that the, the cursor motion went straight to the goal, right? But what was interesting was that um, next slide. Um, as they continued to, to do this um, over the course of many trials, um, the cursor motion started off um, going straight to the goal, but then um, systematically deflected um, to the left of the goal so that they were like overcompensating for the motion, right? So on, on, in, in the left panel, what you see is that if you didn't compensate at all, the cursor motion would show a rightward error being to the right of the goal. Um, but in this experiment where there's an aiming target, um, individuals started off um, with, with um, a motor performance error that was essentially zero, Right, um, but then um, where, where the movement went straight to the goal, but then, then then straight off to the left, very consistently from one person to another. Right, and, and this suggested that motor performance errors couldn't be driving adaptation. Right, because in, in, in this experiment, the motor performance error was initially zero. Right, but there was still some some systematic sort of um, adaptation of, of of the response. And and what, what they thought was it was the difference between. Um, the predicted action. So the idea is that there might be some low-level prediction that even though, the, because you're not used to doing this this kind of task, where if you're aiming off to the left, that you sort of, in some sense, predict the cursor is going to move that way, even though it's a higher cognitive level, you know that's not the case, right? And and that error would be leftward, and so this preserved cursor motion is in the direction of that error, right? However, this is an issue with with, with this interpretation, right? Um, next slide. Right, um, and and that is that this externally generated error that, that I've been um, talking about, right, which is the difference between um, predicted action and um, um, and, um, and the goal is in this ex is is here completely conflated with the difference between the observed action um, and the goal, which is the sensory um, prediction error, right, um, and and there's been. Um, and, and, and the main sort of thing about sensory um, prediction error, shown in purple here, is that it's because of the difference between observed action and the goal, it, is it, it's it, 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 it completely excludes the goal, right, from, um, 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 from its definition, right? So if learning were based on sensory prediction errors, then, um, then the goal would be irrelevant to learning, which seems a little counterintuitive, and, and also is, 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 is sort of doesn't go with um, some you know recent sort of work specifically looking at this, and so in a recent um, paper in Journal of Neuroscience, um, the, the, um, there was there was a study that, that showed that if you were to um, during a movement shift a target right um, from an initial location, which is which is straight above the start position, um, over to the left, like during the course of the movement, right, um, so that the goal w w w was shifted, right, um, then what they found was next slide. Um, a really, really large and specific adaptation, right? And so this suggests that um, <clears throat> that that the goal really is important for for adaptation, you know, in odds with what sensory prediction error um, says, right? But that, um, but what we, but, but what we were really learning in the Mazonian crack hour um, 2006 experiment was that um, was that predicted actions were important, right? And so what they did, what they got wrong was that is that something between predicted actions and observed actions in the upper right um, hand side 
definition for SPE, but the difference between predicted actions and the goal, okay? And so you can call this external generated error. Another name for it might be motor performance prediction error. So like the motor performance error, which is the difference between what you did and the goal, but instead of the, of, of the observed action and the goal, um, motor performance prediction error is the difference between the predicted action um, and, and, and the goal, okay? But um, in the experiments we did so far, um, we couldn't really, even though it seems like this is a reasonable idea, um, we couldn't prove this because we were just doing a, um, um, we were essentially doing um, a, a vision motor rotation experiment um, in which the um, um, in, in which the goal and the um, <clears throat> observed actions, sorry, um, which was the goals, um, um, which the goal was, was was not manipulated, and so we couldn't really tell. Okay, next slide. All right, and so what we did was um, was was an experiment with, with target shifts here, right? Um, like in in that um, in the two thousand twenty um, general neuroscience paper, but but we, we took it sort of to another level, um, and so what they did was they had target shifts um, that um, were used to um, see whether um, sensory um, prediction errors could explain all of learning, and and, and they found that that tech sensory that the target shifts induced adaptation, suggesting that sensory prediction error wasn't the whole um, cause of, of this, of, of motor adaptation, but, but they suggested um, towards the end of their paper that, that, well, sensory prediction error must be, must play a role maybe in addition to motor performance error, right? And so we thought that if we, if we do a sort of a, a more decisive experiment with, with target shifts, we could completely dissociate sensory prediction error, motor performance error, and um, these externally generated errors. Okay, and so what we did here with the experiment was the first part was it was like that last experiment where we had target shifts just shown on the left where the target shifted you know from this sort of center position out to the right. Okay, um, and <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and 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 if we do that sort of target shift shown in, in, in the middle panel, what we see is that um, is that there are. <clears throat> um, Sorry. Um, so sorry. If we do, if we do vision, I apologize for this. If we have a, a vision motor rotation experiment, which is what the, the first experiments that we did, we just um, rotate the um, the target off, sh shown in the left. What we see is the cursor um, goes sort of skewed from from the hand, right? Uh, one is when there is a rotation, and this causes both a sensory prediction error and an externally generated error. Okay. Um, but if instead we have a target shift um, and zero um, visual motor rotation. Then what we see is that um, that that there is going to be um, no sensory prediction error because it's a, it's a shift in the target or the goal, and sensory prediction error doesn't depend on the goal, right? But there's going to be an external generated error because this this target shift is external to the body, and there's of course going to be a performance error because um, the hand or, or the, the cursor doesn't go to the target, okay? Um, but if we if we couple a um, a target shift with a, a vision motor rotation, right, shown in, in, in the right panel, um, in such a way that they compensate for each other, right? So if we shift the target, um, you know, say four degrees to the right, okay, and then and and concomitant with that, have a four degree visual motor rotation, right? Then um, <clears throat> that's going to cause an externally generated error of zero because the target shift by itself would cause a an, a, a, an externally generated error of, of four degrees, and the VMR would cause an externally generated error of negative four degrees, and these would add up um, to zero because they're compensating for each other. Okay, um, and however, um, a motor performance error would similarly be, um, would be zero. Okay, on average, right? Um, but the sensory prediction error would, would be really large because um, we, we predicted that the um, we predicted that um, sorry. Um, we predicted that the cursor would, 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 um, would go straight up because you didn't know about the target shift or, or the VMR, okay? And so, so here we can have, you can have cases where, um, you know, where, where we actually we take like, the sensory prediction are the same as the externally generated error. Um, making, you can make sensory prediction error zero while the externally generated error is, is material or large, or, or we, can, we can do the converse. We make externally generated error zero and the sensory prediction error material or large. Next slide. Okay, um, and so if you look at this first case where we did VMR, which is, this is re replication of the previous results, what you see is the internally generated component of the error seems to not drive adaptive responses at all, but the externally generated component of the error um, 
<clears throat> um, drives these adaptive responses, right? So this is just replication of what we previously had. But in this experiment where these three types of perturbations, both the VMR, the target shift, and the coupled VMR and target shift are given sort of, you know, um, randomly interleaved um, in, in the same experimental paradigm. Okay, next. Next slide. Okay, in, in, in the next condition where we have target shifts alone, right, then what we see um, is that the adaptive responses to internally generated errors, right, are again um, not systematic. There's right. Um, however, um, adaptive responses to external generators are still systematic, right? And so this is sort of this is important because here we're generated externally generated errors. If you look on the left, where where when sensory prediction errors are, are zero, okay, um, and and so um, this shows that um, that that even when there when there are no sensory prediction errors, that these externally generated errors, um, you know, can can drive this. Um, this, this, this adaptive response um, quite quite strongly. Okay, and then next slide. And the final case, what we have is, is a condition where we shift the target. Show, looking on the left, we have a target shift shown in gray and a visual motor rotation also shown in gray. Right, and this causes externally generated errors to go to zero, even though there are large sensory prediction errors. Right, and what we see here is that the is that the um, adaptive response to internally generated errors is, is again essentially zero, and in the response to sensory prediction errors um, is 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 also essentially zero, right? And response to um, <clears throat> uh, external generated errors can't be appreciated here because they're because the external generated errors are zero on, on all these trials. Okay, so next, so if we put these results together, then what we see. Is, is, is a pattern of, of adaptation where vision motor rotation um, in, induces um, you know, systematic adaptive responses to, to EGE. Target shifts res give um, systematic responses to EGE. And, and this matched case where there are no EGEs produces no uh, systematic response to either um, IGE, internal generators, or, or to sensory prediction errors. And the next slide. OK, and so if we, um, um, so Next, we can go to the next slide. We can go to the next slide. Oh, sorry, go back. I think you skipped over. Great. Okay. So, so what we see here, right, is there's, there's a pattern of, of results here, right, um, across these experiments. If you look over on the left, where the VMR produces. Um, big ex, um, externally generated errors, but, but no internally generated errors. Um, target shift um, perturbations produce big externally generated errors, but, but no, no um, internally generated errors, no adaptive responses to them. And the matched um, VMR target shift um, condition shown is these, filled with these dots over on, on, on the right side of, of the left panel um, show that adaptive responses are, 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 are sort of small um, um, to um, both sensory prediction errors and internally generated errors. Um, in, in this case, and we could we can take this whole pattern right of sort of you know six sort of you know, results in some sense, and and compare that to what would be predicted if there were in in, in the middle column internally generated um, error driven learning right externally generated error driven learning SPE driven learning or MPE driven learning okay and we see is that um, this pattern doesn't match um, IGE driven learning where there would, there would be big sort of blue bars in all cases right. Um, but does really closely match what we expect for, for EGE driven learning. Basically, whenever there are red bars um, present, that they're, that they're really high, right? But, but it, it also it totally fails to match what you get for, extern, for, for SP driven learning, where you'd expect um, the result that we found for the VMR experiment with the big sort of red bar um, over on the left. But, but you'd expect that this sort of purple bar be large and positive and very different from what we saw. Um, in the experimental results in, in the left panel. And it doesn't match at all what we expect for uh, mode performance error-driven learning, where it's just the total error that matters. And so um, both internally and externally generated um, components of, sorry, um, parts of the error um, would, uh, would generate adaptive responses because it's just a total um, um, performance error that, that matters, right? And, and, it's the, and the only case where you wouldn't expect any to see a response is when there's just sensory prediction errors without mode performance errors. And, and, the right with purple, right? And so these matches, right, really strongly suggest um, that, that it's um, externally generated errors rather than either internally generated errors or sensory prediction errors that are driving the pattern of adaptation. And on the right 
panel, just statistical comparison between um, each of these models uh, shown on the top and between this, 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 this EGE or MPPE driven, MPPE is a synonym for EGE um, dr driven model versus a combination of SPE and, and MPE driven models, which is what is suggested by, by some, you know, by, by some recent work that didn't look at this so deeply, right? They said, you know, they couldn't find, um, you know, some responses that couldn't be explained by SPE. And so they said, well, maybe it's a combination of SPE and MPE. But with, with our data, we can show that even if you took a combination of, of SPE and MPE, like any arbitrary combination, you still can't explain the adaptive responses as you can see in, in the lower left here. Okay, next. Um, so finally, we did, I'm, I'm, I'm late um, because of our technical difficulties, but um, an experiment to try to look at, well, what about, um, what about learning for explicit strategies? So in all the previous experiments, um, because we had these sort of small random perturbations, people basically didn't use um, ex um, explicit strategies um, frequently or consistently. Um, and so, um, and that's good in, in that we could you know, know that, that, that everything we were finding was, 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 was pertaining to uh, implicit learning, which is probably what we care most about is sort of in, is me being sort of a motor control researcher. But, um, <clears throat> um, but, but, it would be, but it doesn't tell us anything about explicit strategy because people weren't using them. And so we decided, you know, we should do an experiment where we, where we induce um, use of explicit strategies and um, and, 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 and then we, we, can, we can see whether this dichotomy is, 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 is also occurring for um, explicit strategies or not, right? And so what we did was, um, the manipulation we did was basically to give perturbations that, that were now um, consistent in addition to the inconsistent perturbations, okay? So what we wanted, um, so there's, there's a diagram at the top, which is a little hard to see because it's small, but the idea is that we start off with these small, random, unpredictable perturbations to enable us to dissect externally generated air from internally generated air, right? Um, and this is what we've been, been doing. Um, and then we, we add to those perturbations a large, slow, oscillating perturbations. We generate what we call a sum of signs. So we take a sum of sine waves um, over, over trials and sort of add that to the perturbation, all right? And that's shown in, in, in the sort of the left column um, below, right? So the idea is that there's, some, there's a slow sine wave shown in sort of light green and a medium one um, in, 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 in sort of in brighter green and then darker green, maybe slightly faster. Um, sine wave, and we can, if we add those things up, we get something that sort of undulates, you know, kind of grossly kind of randomly looking, so it's sort of a slow undulation, right, that, that, that's sort of, you know, um, you know, grossly less regular than, than each um, sine wave, even though, even though it's totally determined, right? And um, we can take these, um, um, this <clears throat> um, small random perturbation shown in, in blue, and then add them to this, this, this sort of slow um, more consistent um, from one trial to another, um, sum of signs perturbations, and next. Um, and if we add them together, we'll get is, is what's shown in sort of like the, the light blue color here, right? Um, which is just a sort of slow undulation with a sort of random noise on top, right? And so the idea then is that um, we, can, we can perform an experiment with this um, with, with this sort of light blue perturbation pattern, right, that has both these sort of white noise perturbations and these slow undulating perturbations, right? And then we can filter out the re responses at these perturbed frequencies, right, which are here it's sh shown as, if you look over on the, the right, their frequency content of these perturbations is shown, and then the sum of signs, there's frequency content at frequencies of 12 and 16 and 20, right? Um, and then we can look at the responses just at these unperturbed frequencies, right? Even though we've, um, we, um, um, even though we, we, um, we, we elicit an, an um, <clears throat> um, explicit strategy by, by having these um, perturbed frequencies, right? And then we can look and see what happens at these unperturbed frequencies in, um, when people are using ex ex explicit strategies that are going to be induced by this. So we know this is going to work. Uh, we published a recent paper in Nature Neuroscience last year um, showing that when you give these, um, these big um, sum of science perturbations that you get these really strong, robust um, strategy responses and you can use these to dissect strategy in different ways. Okay, next. Um, and, and so um, if, you, if you look at the sort of the raw results, right, what you see is that now, um, <clears throat> so shown over on the left, um, if the, the ideal response to the perturbation is shown in black, right, and then the, the overall um, learning is shown in, in purple, which is pretty close to the black, 
but you can break that down into an implicit um, learning part shown in blue and an explicit strategy part shown in red. And you see is that the blue and the red are both smaller than the total, but they're, but they're also like very consistently like greater than zero in both cases. Okay, and if you put this in terms of the frequency response, what you see is that the overall learning shown as sort of the pink purple here is, um, is, 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 is very similar in amplitude to um, at the perturbed frequencies of, of, 16, um, of 12, 16, and 20 to what the ideal response is, which is just 10 degrees, right? Um, but that um, this, you arrive at this sort of eight degrees of perturbation response shown in pink by having a sum of um, explicit strategy and, and sorry, of e explicit strategy shown in red and implicit learning um, that are they're both you know about equal size. So the here the explicit strategies are actually bigger than the implicit learning. The explicit strategies are about five degrees, and the implicit learning is about about three or four degrees, and they add up to the eight or nine degrees um, total that we see. Right. So here we've succeeded in, um, in 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 invoking a bunch of explicit strategy. Right. And so now we can look at this um, at, at at this internal the results of internal and external generated errors. Um, for, for, for strategy use. Next. Okay, and so if we, um, on, on the, the top two panels show um, the implicit adaptive response, right, separated into um, response to EG, IGE, internally generated errors show on the left, and externally generated errors show on the right, and we see a res result that just, that just um, <clears throat> Um, that just mirrors um, our previous experiments where we're, where we're looking solely at implicit um, adaptive response, okay? Um, but now we get to sort of look at data um, on, on, on the bottom row for um, explicit adaptive response, right? And what we see is this here, the explicit adaptive response um, grossly behaves, you know, identical to implicit adaptive response. And so um, this also doesn't respond to um, internally generated errors but responds strongly to externally generated errors. And the, the, the slope of the relationship, okay, and the strength of the relationship are about identical. You can see the, the, the insets on, on the plots, right? This is suggesting that, that there, even our strategic responses, if you think of those sort of, sort of cognitive, right, they also sort of subtract out um, these um, internally generated errors so that they respond only to externally generated errors. Uh, Maurice, it's a great talk, and I uh, and I hate to uh, interrupt it, but since we are going over time, uh, I was going to ask if possible to uh, if you have a few slides to kind of uh, summary, and then yeah, that was the last slide. Okay, perfect. Sorry, so it's just a summary slide after that. Okay, so what we have is that um, overall motor learning is um, is is denoised by our moving internally generated. Um, motor output noise um, from the teaching signal. These internally generated errors are really internally generated sort of noise in the, 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 the teaching signal. Um, that motor performance um, prediction errors, right, or, uh, um, or also known as externally generated errors, um, um, are what drive um, um, implicit motor learning, right, rather than sensory prediction error, which is, which is what is sort of currently thought. Um, next. Um, that um, that these motor performance prediction errors or externally generated errors um, and um, rather than motor performance errors are what drives strategy learning, which is what we just showed on the very last slide, okay? And I apologize again for um, going over time because it's technical problems and, and um, um, I'm happy to take questions either, you know, specifically about the presentation or, or in general that was um, suggested for the discussion period. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Maurice. It was a great talk and uh, again, in, in ingenious designs as, as usual. Okay. Uh, so First question is from Mr. or Ms. Um, Taz, um, Tagizadeh. Um, the question says, I'll just read the question aloud so I can think about it. Um, thanks for the interesting talk. Is, it, um, is there any indication that internal and external generators are encoded um, slash detected in, in, in different brain areas? Um, if one recorded neural data, what would you predict? Um, would you predict any latency um, in the encoding of, of, of different types of errors? Okay, so this is, um, unfortunately, this is sort of brand new work, and we've just sort of done this behavioral work, and, and the main answer to this is, 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 is no. We, we don't have any, any evidence um, about where are these, um, you know, these, these kinds of you know, signals that are, that are behind this learning um, you know, um, are, are, are taking place, right? Um, and so, you know, um, there's several ideas that could be, you know, um, that can be put forward, right? Um, but um, the, um, 
you know, it, it, it's known that efferent's copy signals, which would be behind the sort of subtraction um, of um, behind the sort of internal predictions that allow you to subtract out um, these internally generated errors from, 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 from the total error signal um, is, um, is, sort of, is widespread throughout the brain. So this could be happening in cortex. Of course, it could be happening in cerebellum, but I can speculate in sort of in, in any, any kind of, you know, sort of in a region, so this could be you know, in, in motor cortex specifically or in, or in parietal, but, but we just simply um, don't know. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Um, so while maybe people are thinking about questions, so it, it, it was a very interesting design, especially uh, your last design where you had both uh, rotation about 30 degrees and then you jumped the target basically uh, to the exact point that would have been the error, right? Right. Yeah, that correctly. So it, it's very interesting. So it's as if you see, like in, in your in your first example with that with the with that stand up comedian. So it's as if you you throw the ping pong ball and and, and and there is a wind, but then someone moves the cup to to catch your catch your ball. Well, uh, sorry, it's not. It's, it's similar. To that it's not exactly that. And that's all right. Maybe I didn't explain it as clear as I could have. Huh. Right. So what um so what we did is sort of it's like we. So we didn't we didn't make the overall error exactly zero, right? What we made was this the externally driven part of the overall error zero, right? Yeah. So it's like in, in in that game where if we suddenly put glasses on 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 the person, like prism glasses that would sort of deflect their vision of the cups, right? Right. Yes. Um, and they made the shot, but then we move the um, we move the cup to the position where they would have been seeing the where they would have seen the cup. Yes. Right, so if they made a mistake in in you know in in in, um, in in how they threw the ball compared to where they actually saw the cup, they would th th that error would, would persist. Right, right. right? But that's um, that would be their internal error. Okay. Yeah. Yes. You're right. Just, so the idea is we were preserving internally generated errors, right? But right. doing you know, manipulation that would um, that would, that would zero out externally generated errors, yet um, yet yet have a, a big fat sensory prediction error. Right, but but so in a way, I, I thought that, that initially I thought the result is very interesting. But then when I thought about it, I thought maybe it's kind of trivial because you don't have any error. You 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 get to the goal. So what? Why do you have to drive learning? The only thing is that you might be very surprised that the that the target jumped uh, where you you know uh, where you didn't expect it. So if if I'm wondering, if, right? So it's only so in, in some sense, like from. A, from an outside perspective, you could say, well, yeah, maybe this is, you know, the, you're generating an error that doesn't matter or something like this, right, in, in terms of, um, in, in terms of you, you're surprised that, that you know, that, you, that your hand went differently than you expected, but in terms of how well you did, um, it, it didn't really change anything, right? Yeah. Um, and so this is really only critical if you sort of, um, you know, if you believe in sensory prediction errors from the beginning, mm -hmm. right? So, right. like the theory of sensor prediction error, which is really kind of a super kind of, you know, kind of widespread and really taken as sort of doctrine in, in lots of kind of motor control research nowadays, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, says that, you know, it is sensory prediction error that drives learning, like no, no question, no discussion, right? And, and in that case, this, this sort of surprise about where your hand went is your sensory prediction error. And, and, and the point is just to show that really sort of clearly that, you know, so in the, um, in the Liao et al. paper that, that I mentioned, they showed that well, if you if you had um, um, if, if if you have a case where um, you know um, w w w w where the, where where the target jumps right um, to, that, that would you know that, that would create um, a, an error that was different than sensory prediction error, right? Then then you could have even though you didn't have sensory prediction error, you 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 would see a lot of learning. And here, what I'm showing is that. Um, if you if you do something where you create a really big sensory prediction error and then but but nothing else like no 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 externally generated error right then you don't have learning so this is, this, so the, you know their result showed that there may be something contributing to learning besides sensory prediction error but but this result shows that if you if you create a big massive sensory prediction error um, but you control the external generated error you get essentially no learning out of it okay. right so if your intuition is a sensory prediction error it doesn't matter then this is a boring result. But if you, if you believe in sensory prediction error, then this is a very surprising result. And one final question, so I make sure that I and the rest of the people understand. So I, I thought that the subtraction between observed action and predicted action is actually the externally generated error. But 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 we we're calling this SPE, 
even though in your diagram, in the first diagram that you had, uh, I thought that really the difference between what you predict and what you see is really the external error that comes in and perturbs the system. Why, why, why is there, you know, what, what, what did I get? Sorry, just repeat that, repeat that really quickly. So the, sure. so the difference between observed action and predicted action, I thought, I thought that's the, uh, that should be uh, the externally generated error because you have a predicted action through your efference copy and then someone perturbs that, so your observed action uh, deviates. Well, no, so that's so the difference between observed action and 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 predicted, predicted action. action. You should, yeah, that shouldn't that be that's that's external generated error, right? But I thought, but I thought you called that SPE. Oh, so remember this prediction, this prediction here that I'm talking about is the prediction that's sort of denoising, like you know, with respect to like the 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 the, the inconsistency of, of of your motion, right? So. If you're, you know, if, 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 if you somehow, when the ball leaves, you're shooting basket free throws, when the ball leaves your hand, if somehow you know that you, that, that, that you didn't shoot it as forcefully as, as you should have, that you kind of predicted it to hit the, hit the front rim, right? And then you actually saw it hit the front rim, then you wouldn't be surprised, right? And, 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 and so, you, the, 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 you know, then the ball is not acting differently than you thought it would, right? So there's no externally generated air there. Like there's no wind, for instance, that, the, 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 you know, to push the ball, um, you know, away, or there's, there's, there, there's no, like, you know, miscalculation about, like, how the ball would travel through the air. Uh, okay, uh, so I thank you again, Maurice, for coming uh, and, uh, and the speech. We're going to have three...